A ceasefire agreement marks a historic breakthrough in the peace talks between Colombia's government and the FARC rebel group. Could it be the final step in ending their 50-year conflict? I'm Elaine Reyes in Washington, D.C., and this is America's Now. Long before any peace talks were in place, hundreds of former Colombian fighters from different rebel groups decided to join forces around a farming project and rebuild their lives. There is not a place in Colombia where ex-rebels from the FARC and paramilitaries work together. Correspondent Toby Muse met with a man who voluntarily put away their weapons to grow pineapple. What he found was revealing. Next, he is considered a talented prodigy in archery, and he's aiming for a gold medal in the Summer Games in Rio. Marcus Vinicius de Almeida is our Olympian this week. And later, she was running for president in Colombia in 2002 when FARC rebels kidnapped her. The purpose is to give to my children uh, the possibility to live in a country where we could be free and in peace. Do you, Ingrid, still struggle with forgiveness sometimes? Correspondent Michelle Begay sits down with Ingrid Betancourt. She shows us how a victim of this 50-year conflict is now seeking forgiveness. Welcome to this show. Colombians are hopeful their government can soon sign definitive peace agreements with the country's two largest rebel groups. But they also understand the process of reconciliation after half a century of armed conflict will need the work of 48 million Colombians and take years. America's now correspondent Toby Muse went to a farm in eastern Colombia where former enemies have been living off the land in peace. The sun rises over Colombia's magnificent eastern plains. The farm La Fortuna wakes up and the chores begin. Breakfast is prepared. Animals must be fed. From the outside, it looks like just another of the countless farms that dot Colombia's countryside. But these men and women say their farm is unique. Most of the 100 people who live and work here are former enemies, ex-fighters from Colombia's civil war. In the violence, they fought each other, but now in peace, they work together. Yo me atrevo a decirlo acá que no hay un proyecto similar en Colombia que albergue familias de FARC, ELN y AUC en un solo proyecto productivo, no un proyecto a corto plazo ni a mediano plazo, sino a largo plazo. They hope that their farm can be a model for the future of Colombia. Con la idea de mostrar, ¿no? De, de, no, casualmente se vuelve un ejemplo porque sí pueden haber más más proyectos, pueden haber eh, otras clases de, de, de proyectos de personas en proceso de reintegración. Old grudges have been so buried, even romantic relationships have blossomed between the old enemies porque finalmente resultaron saliendo parejas de un desmovilizado de guerrilla con una con una desmovilizada de AUC o viceversa. Even as these men and women have started on a new life, some still judge their histories. Y se enteran de que esas piñas las están produciendo los desmovilizados, muy fácilmente les cierran las puertas. Dicen, no, qué pena, pero no es básicamente porque tengan de verdad sus compromisos, sino es por no darle la oportunidad a uno, porque sienten desconfianza, porque sienten miedo. What to do with ex-fighters is one of the biggest questions facing Colombia. Since 2003, nearly 60,000 combatants have laid down their weapons. Some, like those here in La Fortuna, have created successful new lives. Uno, dos, Others have returned to the gun, taking their skills in killing to the cocaine cartels. Others have been murdered. But the question is urgent. 
if the government signs a peace deal this year with the largest guerrilla group, tens of thousands of new guerrillas could be laying down their arms and trying to return to society. Humberto Fernandez was a member of Colombia's far-right paramilitaries until the group disbanded in 2005. After a life in the militia, Humberto found civilian life difficult. Es muy difícil porque cuando se tenía el poder y cuando se tenían las armas, simplemente no, uno, uno no pedía ni siquiera el favor, uno daba la orden. Yo andaba en un carro fino, un carro que tenía cómodo para andar, cargaba mi fusil, cargaba incluso plata en una maleta. He wanted to start a farm and was looking for as many workers as possible. A friend suggested he meet with his old enemies, ex-rebels. Pues nos pareció como una idea muy loca en el momento porque no lo veíamos por ningún lado que nos reunieran y mucho menos que nos pudiéramos mezclar en el tema de negocios y que pudiéramos llegar a ser socios, aun cuando existía como ese odio de muchos años de enemigos. Ese proceso y empezamos a descubrir que en esas otras personas igualmente habían otros seres humanos iguales a nosotros y ellos también vivieron la misma experiencia. They started the farm from scratch. To this day, it still lacks infrastructure, like running water. For irrigation, they must connect the pipes to the nearby river. From the beginning, there was one unbreakable rule. No vamos a hablar de historia. O sea, de dónde operaba yo, qué hacía y por dónde estuve, y a quién le hice o a quién no le hice. No talk of personal histories was meant to avoid bad blood, but it also represented the new life the men were embarking on. Since then, they've had no problems between the workers. No ha habido un problema dentro de los dentro de los miembros de, de acá de la empresa, ninguno con ni digamos de los de izquierda con los de derecha ni los de derecha con izquierda. Deje López was one of the founders of the farm, a former rebel of the FARC. A los 20 años ingreso a la, a la guerra y a los 30 años me retiré del, del grupo, me deserté y llego a, a esa conclusión de por eso yo, yo qué hago aquí, yo soy un tipo inteligente, capaz y, y yo puedo hacer otras cosas que están perdiendo mi tiempo acá. At first, a life of peace was hard for him too. Después de 10 años en, en un grupo, llega a la sociedad como que no sé de nada, no sé qué hacer, no, porque en realidad las oportunidades a ustedes se las dan, pero en el momento de que se dan de cuenta de que usted fue de un grupo, uy, qué miedo. He realizes that many demobilized have returned to crime, but asks that Colombia put aside its prejudices and treat each ex-fighter on his or her own merits. Life isn't easy for the demobilized in Colombia. The police say that around 3,000 or 5% of those who have laid down their arms have been killed. Some for past vendettas, others because they return to the underworld. No deja uno de tener si ese temor de no sé qué vaya a pasar conmigo. Cuando nosotros eh, eh, recién nos desmovilizamos, empezaron a, a, a matar selectivamente muchachos. For Deje, reconciliation is what Colombia needs after more than half a century of a brutal civil war. Esto ha traído también mucha reconciliación, porque cuando una persona llega y dice, uy, no, vecino, a mí me daba miedo venir aquí por lo que la gente comenta a los alrededores. Entonces lo bonito es cuando vienen, hablan con nosotros y se dan cuenta de que en realidad aquí hay personas comunes y corriente, trabajando, que, que lo que queremos es, es trabajar. And just like here at the farm, both sides must forgive their enemies and ask for forgiveness. La reconciliación se, se, se trata de perdón tanto de los unos como de los otros. Porque a mí me sirve 
muchísimo más de un amigo que un enemigo. Yo con un enemigo, ¿para qué? ¿Para qué enemigo? Usted no, usted no lo necesita, en cambio los amigos sí. Los amigos son muy importantes en, la, en el camino, y más en el camino que estamos nosotros. Deja has no regrets leaving the war behind him. Civiles muy sabrosos, muy hermosa y usted siente como, como ese aire fresco de la tranquilidad de que usted no está recibiendo orden, de que usted trabaja y se gana su, 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 su salario, su platica y se la gasta como usted quiera, con quien usted quiera, eh, con esa libertad de decir me voy a ir a visitar a un familiar. Nosotros somos desarrimados, yo el hombre déjelo porque cuando está para abajo para... The experiences of this farm could be much more relevant in the coming months. Colombia is embarked on its most important peace process in decades, a final deal with the largest guerrilla group, the FARC. Tens of thousands of fighters could be laying down their arms. He worries that the prejudice that he faced could affect the future of the peace deal. Me parece a mí que, que la intención de, 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 de ellos era sacar un poco de, 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 de gente que estaba en armas y tratar como de... de, de de meterlos a la, a la sociedad, pero dejémoslos ahí que se defiendan como pueda. Eso es un gran error porque resulta que la gente que está acostumbrada a conseguir lo que necesiten por medio de las armas, en el momento de que no tengan empleo, de que no sepan qué hacer en la ciudad, dicen, no, pues yo me voy a buscar donde me gano la comida más fácil, donde me gano la vida fácil. Cojo otra vez un arma y, y ahí, ahí tengo que hacer. These demobilized say that they've changed. And now they need Colombia to change, to leave behind its prejudices. El problema que tenemos nosotros como como reinsertados es la misma sociedad con un estigma tan fuerte que tiene y con un rechazo y como yo no le doy una oportunidad más porque esta persona se equivocó. O sencillamente porque este se equivocó, lo cojo y le doy piedra y lo acabo. Está bien, pero también tienen que reconocerle a uno que reconocí en mi momento que me había equivocado y que di un paso para eh, resarcir ese daño y decir hasta aquí llego, ya no vuelvo a hacer más daño, voy a iniciar y voy a empezar una nueva vida. Pienso que la reconciliación, más que quitarle el arma a una persona y traerlo a una sociedad, es darle oportunidades porque, y crearle un arraigo. Cuando yo tengo un arraigo en la sociedad civil, cuando yo tengo un, un, un compromiso, tengo un empleo, cuando yo tengo una empresa por cual preocuparme, yo no pienso en volverme a, a, a delinquir o volver a la guerra. It's a lesson they've learned here in La Fortuna. They hope the rest of the country will soon catch up. Thanks to Toby Muse for that report. According to the country's agency for reintegration, more than 26,000 Colombians went through the process of demobilization and assimilation into society. For more on what's next in Colombia's peace process, we're joined by political analyst Laura Carlson in Mexico City. Laura, welcome back to America's Now. Uh, let's begin where our last story ended. There are still several thousand guerrilla fighters that will need to be incorporated into civilian life. Colombia's unemployment rate is around 9%. So what is the government doing to get them jobs and reintegrate them into society? This is one of the big challenges of the peace process. There's an estimated 7 to 8,000 FARC combatants that will be reinserted into society. The first step is to go in what's called a transitory zone. And from there, the government is focus, focusing what they call quick start development projects in the FARC zone of influence to begin to generate jobs for many of these people. It will require much more than just providing a job, though. What they've learned from the reintegration process is that it, it requires counseling, education, and employment in, only, in order to successfully reincorporate people. They're providing tax breaks for private sector companies also to, to provide jobs for these people. And one of the big points will be what was mentioned in the previous report, the willingness of especially rural communities to welcome these combatants 
back into the society. So the reconciliation factor is going to be very important there. With an estimated 2.5% growth, that's a big slowdown for Columbia next year, and that won't make it any easier. Well, in a major recent development, Columbia and the FARC signed a ceasefire agreement. How significant is this step, step and, and does it provide momentum in getting that final deal signed? Absolutely. This was the fifth point of the agenda that's taken over three years of negotiations. And what many experts call this is the point of no return, meaning that from here on out, there's still things that have to be worked out, but the peace process is, is a done deal. They have a six point on implementation and verification that they have to work out, but this point, which is called the end of the conflict, was extremely important, and it was celebrated throughout the world and not just in Colombia. This means that there's a bilateral ceasefire. There was already a unilateral ceasefire, but this means that the open conflict will end and the rest of it will just be negotiating these points that have to do with some of the pending things from the past negotiations and the implementation stages. Well, every negotiation process demands give and take. So what are Colombians giving up? Do you think that they are ready to forgive and forget? Well, the main thing that they're giving up is the so-called military solution, and that is the complete physical annihilation of the FARC, which was what former President Uribe was calling for. This didn't work for 50 years, and that's why they entered into the peace process in the first place. There's been, you know, give and take on both sides. The FARC didn't want to have a referendum. They were afraid that they could go through this whole process and then have the people reject it. They finally agreed to a referendum. There's a system of special jurisdiction where there's amnesty for FARC members that have not committed heinous crimes, such as kidnapping, sexual torture, abuse, and for all members of the conflict that have not committed these kinds of crimes, crimes against humanity. Uh, so many people believe that's a form of leniency. And yet this is the kind of give and take that we see. It's really important to mention that they're not talking about forgetting. Reconciliation is not necessarily forgetting. In fact, there's a truth commission form that will be investigating the kinds of crimes, especially crimes against humanity, that took place during the conflict. And the main point of continuing with these investigations and continuing with prosecution for these very serious crimes is to avoid repeating them in the future. What does history say, though? How have these kinds of peace processes and reconciliation worked in other parts of the world? Well, Lane, it's complicated. What we see in real general terms is that that have taken place manage to resolve the immediate conflict. We see this from Northern Ireland, in which there's a peace process and the implementation phase goes well, and you, have, uh, and you achieve a fairly lasting peace. In Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslavia, we had a peace process where the same was true, but then there was a continuing process of, of trials against crimes against humanity and of truth and justice that went on after that. When we look to Central America, which is probably the most analogous case, being of the same region, what we find is that in 1992 there was the Chapultepec Peace Accord, Accords in El Salvador, and what happened in El Salvador? It resolved the immediate conflict, there began to be implementation, there were problems with implementation, and then in the longest term we had the reintegration of the FMLN, they're now the leadership of the country, but we have a, a tremendous level of violence within the country. And I think the major, uh, the major challenge for these peace processes is to understand that it's not just resolving a single conflict, but creating a culture of peace. And that means demilitarizing and teaching that violence is not the resolution to social conflicts or problems. Guerrilla groups have often been linked to drug dealing and kidnapping, and many have actually accused the FARC of being a drug cartel. So how will issues outside of the immediate discussions be dealt with? 
Well, first of all, the FARC was, by all evidence, involved in drug trafficking, uh, in trafficking itself and charging quotas to finance the war from drug traffickers who went through its territory. So that's not an issue. But this actually was not left out of the negotiations. There was a whole point on drug trafficking and drug policy that was negotiated, and it was negotiated that they would cease to be involved in drug trafficking. Also, with no territorial control after the dismantling of the FARC, then you no longer have the same situation that gave rise to that, and they no longer have a reason to finance the war. There were, however, some issues that were left out of the negotiations that are continued to be very important. And one of them was the peace talks with the ELN, the other, other guerrilla group. The government is going to have to accelerate peace talks with the ELN. The other is that the paramilitary groups, now known as criminal bands or BACRIM in Colombia, uh, are still operating and in fact are involved in much of the illicit drug trade. So in order to create a lasting peace, the government's going to have to crack down on those groups as well and also eliminate their involvement in what's been a rising level of human rights violations, especially attacks on human rights defenders and activists in the country. Political analyst Laura Carlson in Mexico City, thank you for joining us here on the show. Coming up next on America's Now, a talented archer aiming for the gold. Coming up. Hi, my name is Mark Nomeda. I'm going to be to here 2016. America's Now. Welcome back to America's Now. A young archer from Brazil is our featured athlete on our special Olympian segment this week. Archery is considered to be one of the oldest sports in the world. At a competitive level, it requires extreme levels of discipline and precision. Marcus Vinicius de Almeida rose to fame during the 2014 World Cup. There he came in second place at just 16 years old. Marcus is this week's Olympian. Eu ponho é, do meu arco aquela parte amarela. É a única parte fixa do arco que não se mexe, é o que dá a estabilidade do arco. Tem os estabilizadores, que são frontal, lateral e extensor. As lâminas são as partes que envergam, que te dá a potência, da velocidade da flecha, que é marcar a parte cinza, que dão a estabilidade do arco. E a função dele é essa e dá uma maior precisão. Tem a mira. A gente consegue ajustar ela com cliques para esquerda, para direita, para cima e para baixo, para melhor precisão. Tem o buto, que é uma parte bem pequenininha do lado onde a gente encaixa a flecha, que é o, é o maior diferencial. Então a gente regula para como o arqueiro gosta. Tem o rest que é o descanso da flecha, que a gente, a gente coloca a flecha, que no arco é a parte vermelha. Tem o clique, que é como se fosse o gatilho. Tem a flecha que faz feito de carbono, fibra de carbono, ponta de aço ou de tungstênio. É a pena, existem vários modelos, vários formatos, normalmente de plástico. Tem o nock, que é de plástico, que é o que encaixa na corda. É a parte que prende na corda para dar velocidade. Hi, my name is Marcos Almeida. I'm gonna be to Rio 2016. Comecei com 12 anos de idade em 2010. E em 2012, com 14 anos, eu estava na seleção. O que eu achei no arco foi a, a chance de crescer, de subir, de poder competir nacional, de poder ser campeão, poder ser tudo isso, que em outros esportes eu demorei muito tempo e não cheguei nesse nível. Primeiro eu me 
paixão, depois minha fonte de, de renda. Pode ser um pouco monótono, a gente pode dizer. Mas... Quem pratica, quem entende, sabe que não é, porque... Cada dia tem um desafio, cada dia tem algo a ser batido, cada dia tem algo a melhorar. Então, pra gente que tá praticando, não é só, tipo, soltar a flecha, e, como todo mundo parece. A importância da, da técnica eu acho que é 90%. Porque você tem que ter uma técnica muito bem afiada. Porque qualquer coisa pode mudar um tiro, qualquer mínimo detalhe muda um tiro. Tanto é que ninguém nunca chegou à perfeição. Os outros 10% é o mental. Você tem um mental muito bom. Eu tô ali pra dar meu melhor em todas as competições que eu tô. E se der certo, deu. Se não der, eu vou pra casa e voltar a treinar. Porque é uma competição de muita concentração. É, você tem que ficar muito tempo concentrado, muita, muito tempo ali fazendo a mesma coisa. Quando eu tô atirando, acho que a percepção é mais lenta. Quando eu tô armado, quando eu tô esperando pra soltar a flecha. Mas quando eu solto, depois parece que tudo vai passando muito rápido. Pode passar muitas coisas. Na minha cabeça, em... Vamos por 7 segundos, que é normalmente dura um tiro. Se você não tá preparado, aí é que faz a diferença no primário mental, pode passar... Uma vida inteira. Você pode estar tão focado e tão bem preparado que você pode estar pensando nessa flecha vai no 10. Essa flecha vai no amarelo. Ou você está tão focado que você consegue, às vezes, não pensar em nada. Parece que você está num mundo sozinho que só aquilo vai dar certo. Eu conheço muito melhor quem eu sou e como agir de várias maneiras. Na, no cotidiano, quanto no tiro com arco. É isso que faz você ter um autoconhecimento muito grande de você, você sabe o que está acontecendo. E às vezes é até estranho você conhecer tanto de você. Última série! Uma pessoa focada em medalhas. Sempre isso. E um cara carinhoso, um, uma pessoa boa. Um atleta disciplinado. Eu se ele é melhor em função do arco também. Em função de todos os esportes que ele fez. Eu acho que a nossa família ajuda muito ele. Ele, ele tem a confiança da nossa família. Ele tem o respaldo da nossa família. Ele sabe que nós estamos atrás dele. Em qualquer momento, em qualquer alegria, em qualquer frustração. Na dúvida, na vitória, na derrota, em tudo, é sempre a família que tá. Não tem, não tem outra pessoa que esteja. Então, é a pessoa mais importante para mim e eu dedico cada vitória à minha família, porque não tem outra pessoa para dedicar. Eu saio de casa sem olhar para as portas. Eu olho para um lado, para o outro, eu paro em qualquer lugar. Ele esqueceu. Né? Ver um teu filho no banco de trás foi um, não foi muito bom. Esse episódio foi, foi uma, um dos causadores para a nossa melhora de qualidade de vida. Graças a Deus. Hoje em dia eu até agradeço. Ah, que mudou nossas vidas. Para melhor. O meu sonho é representar bem o Brasil. 
consegui fazer o meu melhor. E subir no pódio é o sonho. Eu vejo o tiro com arco sempre na minha vida, porque eu comecei muito jovem, 12 anos, ele me... Hoje eu tenho tudo graças ao tiro com arco e eu só tenho a agradecer muito a ele e eu quero sempre estar disputando, tá sempre botando ele em evidência para que venham outros jovens, outras pessoas para disputar em nível muito grande. É um esporte apagado, era um esporte que quase ninguém conhecia, que pouco ouvia falar que era arco e flash, não era nem tiro com arco. E meu sonho é não deixar morrer mais. Mais sonhadores que nem eu que venham, que tem, que nasçam pensando, ah, meu filho vai ser um, um, um arqueiro, sabe? Esse é o meu sonho. Acho que, e esse, não tem como, esse, esse objetivo eu bater. Porque todo dia vai nascer uma pessoa e eu quero sempre estar o tiro com arco no meio dos brasileiros. Marcus has benefited from a global team. A South Korean coach hired by the Brazilian Archery Federation first spotted him when he was 14. He became youth world champion under the direction of an English coach, and he is currently working with an Italian trainer. Coming up. A woman lobbying for reconciliation in Colombia. I have always thought that perhaps the most difficult thing would be to embrace the people that harmed me. Um, I think that now I'm ready. America's Now. Welcome back. She wanted to become president of Colombia, but was kidnapped and held by the FARC rebel group for six years. Ingrid Betancourt lives in France now, but she paid a visit to her home country to discuss reconciliation. She believes that as the government negotiates peace, Colombians need to do their part. Correspondent Michelle Begay brings us her story. Para estar con ustedes hoy, he recorrido un camino largo, ciertamente dramático, pero culminado con un final feliz. Politician Ingrid Betancourt last visited Colombia, her birth country, in 2010. Internationally, she is the face of Colombia's armed conflict, held hostage for six years by the leftist guerrilla group Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, also known as FARC. In her home country, she is just one of the hundreds of victims who suffered years of brutal captivity. I thought that Colombia was living, or is actually living, um, a turning point in history. And I thought that because of uh, what I had lived and my experience as a victim, but also my knowledge of the FARC, I could uh, bring some reflections that could give just, you know, like certainty. As the FARC and Colombian government negotiate the end of 50 years of armed conflict, Betancourt came back to Colombia this May to participate in a forum that promotes reconciliation. But to understand her road towards forgiveness, she began by recalling her past. In 2002, Betancourt was running for president when FARC rebels kidnapped her. Era un campo de concentración en la selva con rejas y alambre de púas y garitas en cada esquina. She was shackled in chains, starved and beaten. But the hardest thing she described was being torn away from her two teenage children, Lorenzo and Melanie. The days and months stretched into years, 
and Ingrid struggled not to lose hope. Durante todos esos años de secuestro luché por no perder ese algo único. Mientras era reducida a ser una cosa, un objeto controlado por otros, alienadas de las decisiones más propias, como la de tener que pedir permiso para ir al baño. Betancourt's mother and children, as many of the family members of hostages, would campaign for a negotiated release. International marches were held each year. Her children would send messages across Colombian radio, hoping that their mother was listening. Tú me quieres ver vivir. Yo quiero que yo quiero que comas lo mejor posible y que tengas el deseo de vivir. Mami, te estaré mandando mensajes el lunes, miércoles y viernes por RFI. También otros si puedo por RCN o Radio Caracol. Espero de todo mi corazón que nos pueda ayudarte. Mi alma está contigo. Me haces demasiada falta. Te amo. Today, Ingrid describes her captivity with sorrow, as if she were reliving it. But in this speech, she also reflects on how war makes everyone a victim. She describes how her captor, a FARC commander, is forced to make his partner have an abortion. Pero cuando este hombre lloró por ese niño sin nacer, vi que en él había un hombre tan secuestrado como yo. No solo porque lo habían alienado de las decisiones más íntimas de su vida, sino porque la guerra lo había convertido en ese mismo delincuente del cual había creído huir al volverse guerrillero. Comprendí en la selva que víctimas de la deshumanización éramos todos, los secuestrados y los secuestradores. In 2008, after six years, Colombian forces in a special operation rescued Ingrid Betancourt and three kidnapped U.S. military contractors. Her emotional return was broadcast on live television. The images of the long-awaited reunion with her family brought hope and happiness to a nation that was tired of the armed conflict's heartbreak. Eight years after her release, she has come back to Colombia to talk about her road towards letting go of her lost years in captivity. No hay nada más fuerte que el perdón para detener la deshumanización. Es por eso que el perdón es algo que se da sin necesidad de que sea solicitado. Es, si se quiere, una estrategia individual de sobrevivencia para deshacerse de las cadenas del odio y descargarse del peso de la venganza. Do you, Ingrid, still struggle with forgiveness sometimes? Yes, I do. Of course I do. Um, emotionally. But, uh, well, I know it's part of the, the process. Um, that's why I think that now I have to, to get to a, a third gear which is coming to see the other and uh, I have always thought that perhaps the most difficult thing would be to embrace the people that harmed me. Um, I think that now I'm ready. Cuando salí de la selva hace ocho años, la Colombia a la cual volví era una Colombia donde hablar de perdón era sinónimo de derrota o de entreguismo. Pensar en dialogar con la guerrilla era traicionar a la patria. Today, Colombia is negotiating a peaceful end to the decades of conflict with the guerrilla. On June 23rd, the Colombian government and FARC leaders signed a historic bilateral ceasefire deal. The event is one of the last steps before a final peace agreement, which is expected in the coming month. While many Colombians celebrated the announcement from Havana, Cuba, there are still those who don't agree with the peace process. Betancourt makes a call to understand both sides. Cada una de las partes tuvo motivos para entrar en la guerra. Puede que los de los demás no nos parezcan válidos. Pero si despreciamos las motivaciones del otro, estamos en peligro de traicionar nuestra oportunidad de reconciliación. And the hatred I can feel for them. I mean, the, the, the purpose is to give to my children uh, the possibility to live in a country where we could be free and in peace. So um, when this, I talk about people that are not tuned with, with uh, the peace process, just because I think that 
in the bottom of their hearts, and I think this is real Colombia, we all want peace. W we have different strategies to get to the same point, but we are all longing to have a country where we're not divided anymore. At the forum, other former hostages of the FARC participate in a conversation about peace. They talk of their road towards letting go of the violence they lived. The moderator asks if they are ready to embrace former members of the FARC. Clara Rojas was Ingrid Betancourt's campaign manager and was kidnapped with her. These former FARC hostages stand together to start a new chapter in Colombian history. They invite their fellow Colombians to look at reconciliation as more than just magical realism. With the signing of a peace agreement, this nation will have to find its way from forum into action. Two hundred and seventy nine civilian organizations joined forces and toured Colombia. They held conferences and open debates about reconciliation. They say they've reached over six million people so far, the equivalent of one eighth of the country's population. Coming up. A Colombian journalist talks about forgiving the unforgivable. In, países como Colombia, in countries like Colombia, where the rate of reading is low, the media has a duty to inform as well as educate. America's Now. Welcome back to America's Now. Colombia is a country where kidnappings, extortions, and killings were part of the norm. Stories of hope, love, and respect were hardly ever heard of. In an effort to change the minds of our fellow countrymen, journalist Claudio Palacios decided to travel across the nation and ask one question. Would you forgive? The answers are found in a book titled Forgiving the Unforgivable. Claudio Palacios is this week's Urban Voice. Thirty in the morning, and like many Colombians, Claudia Palacios starts her day early in the city of Bogota, this nation's capital. Vi en esta carrera algo que me gusta y es ser el servicio. Las selecciones de fútbol masculinas de Colombia. Pienso que ya te quedas en Colombia es un país que ofrece muchos hechos de interés para la región. Solamente con el proceso de paz en curso, pues ahí. She's a respected journalist and a writer too. Palacios is interested in politics and current events. Moderating forums are part of her routine. This one takes place at Universidad Javeriana, one of the oldest universities in the country. The conference is about the city mayor's new development plan. Her involvement in public events shows her commitment to serving the community. In países como Colombia, donde el índice de lectura es tan bajo, los medios, además de informar, deben educar. En junio de 1964, creamos un programa en el que se, se dio a conocer a toda la opinión pública. El movimiento es un movimiento de autodefensa. Nacen las Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionarias FARC. En Colombia hemos contado tanto la guerra que las víctimas ya tienen respecto a los periodistas cierto cansancio. muy orgulloso. No sé quisiera que en realidad hubiera más. A ver si uno puede 
pues uno puede pronto, ya el pueblo, el pueblo pueda progresar. Todos queremos la paz y esperemos que esto sea, sea cierto. Palacios has met with over a hundred of her fellow Colombians, including politicians, ex-guerrilla members, and victims of the war in her country. Their topic of conversation? The consequences derived from over a half century of violence and anger. The result? Chronicles of Hope. Está el caso de Marta Mora. Aquel caballero negro me abraza y pronuncia aquellas mágicas palabras. Yo no tengo paz. Perdóneme, señora. Es una mujer a la que los paramilitares le asesinaron a su marido. Ella quedó sola con sus dos hijos. Y ella, que es toda chiquitica, encaró al asesino de su marido. Y le dice, ¿cómo hizo eso? ¿Por qué? ¿Por qué? Y él empieza a llorar. Y ellos viven ahí un momento en que terminan abrazados, llorando. Y lloramos. Y temblé, no de miedo, sino de sublime comprensión, y pude saborear, gracias a Dios, el néctar dulce del perdón. These are the stories about victims, their victimizers, and their will to overcome hate and fear through art, sports, faith, or simply love. All covered in over 300 pages. Pedí perdón por haberlo insultado al que mandó a matar a mi hijo, Teresita Gaviria. Cada vez que a ti le suena su teléfono celular, se oye la voz del cantante Rubén Blades. Despiertas. Que alguien me diga si ha visto a mi hijo. Es estudiante de premedicina, se llama Agustín, es buen muchacho. El buen muchacho de Teresita es Cristian Camilo Quiroz Gaviria y no es su único desaparecido. Her book, which translates into Forgiving the Unforgivable, invites the reader to contribute to a permanent peace. Yo, cuando decidí hacer el libro, lo hice con la intención de contar que la guerra se puede superar. Por eso es un libro que aunque narra historias de tragedia, siempre terminan en algo que tiene que ver con esperanza. Like many of her fellow Colombians, Palacios was born into a nation of violence, although she isn't a direct victim of the conflict. She encourages a change and believes that there are other ways to a peaceful life, something that can be achieved by what she calls little peace agreements. Pero para responder tu pregunta, esperemos un momentico aquí, Ramiro. Después de haber hecho 126 entrevistas por todo el país, para mi libro Perdonar lo Imperdonable, creo que ha faltado que la ciudadanía entienda que la construcción de la paz es un tema de todos. La paz realmente verdadera, sostenible, es algo que cada quien, desde el rol que desempeña en la sociedad, sea panadero, sea madre de familia, sea ama de casa, sea ingeniero, sea arquitecto, sea periodista, debe construir poniendo su talento, su conocimiento, su tiempo, eh, sus recursos a la construcción de la paz. So, is it possible to forgive? Sí, es posible. Estas víctimas que dieron su para el libro y muchas otras que no caben ahí han demostrado que sí es posible. Lo más común es que perdón sea un regalo que la víctima se hace a ella misma y no a su victimario. Porque la víctima en el momento que perdona se desconecta del pensamiento sobre su victimario. Ya piensa en otras cosas. En términos de ese significado de perdón es que es posible perdonar lo imperdonable. Colombia has yearned for peace for decades. And through the many years, many governments, and many attempts at resolution, it finally seems that this nation can write a new chapter in its history. Hay muchas cosas eh, por resolver, pero pues es el inicio. El tipo no me decía nada. Through Palacios' stories, the reader is educated and invited to contribute to their peaceful and sublime future. Pero le dije que lo perdonaba. According to Palacios, most of the violence is not the product of the conflict, but the way Columbia Day problems. Her publishing house is in negotiations to translate her book into English so the message can reach a broader audience. A 
America's Net. Finally, we stay in Colombia where restrictions against graffiti art have been relaxed so that urban artists can fill Bogota's walls with color. We leave you with these vivid images of street art in the country's capital. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again next week for another edition of America's Now.